Hello, Fulcrum Knights and those who are yet to join the Order. Thank you for turning on this audiobook of Resident Evil Caliban Cove. Welcome to part four. My name is Harry. I will be reading for you today. You can follow Fulcrum Entertainment on Twitter at Fulcrum underscore ENT. And if you're looking for another part of this audiobook or any other audiobooks, please go into the description below to find links to all our playlists. It's always great to talk to our friends out there listening, so let's do that right now. And I want to say hello to Ethan Neeson, who on the last video commented, Hi, it's me. You're very good at your audios. I keep saying it because it's true. Please keep up the good work. Thank you so much for the encouragement, Ethan. It's been a long week, and I really do appreciate it. And Darth Gamer, who has said, I can only wonder what kind of fan art will be born of the Knights of Fulcrum. But, to quickly answer your question about the Death Troopers, the Star Wars zombies, I believe that the Death Troopers most certainly can use weapons like blasters, especially considering that Dr. Cody noticed that the blasters around her had disappeared along with the dead bodies when she met Han and Chewie. Mmm, interesting. If you have not heard that story, please go and look for the audiobook here on the channel. It is very, very good. I love that book. I'm very happy with it, and I haven't even finished it yet. And uh, Darth Gamer, very interesting to think about them using blasters, since we are going to see a bunch of zombies using guns in this video. So, let's get on to that as quick as we can, so I will start reading now with Chapter 9. As Steve read aloud, Rebecca saw David glance between his watch and the door several times. She didn't think it had been ten minutes, but it had to be close. John and Karen weren't back yet. Where each is designed to measure application of logic, as combined in next projective techniques with internal precision. It was rather dry reading. Apparently, a facility report on the analysis of some kind of IQ test. It had obviously been written by a scientist. Was, in fact, the kind of boring double-talk that a lot of researchers tended to fall into when trying to explain anything more complicated than a chair. Still, it was what had come up when Steve had asked for information on Blue Series. Since the room had yielded little else, Rebecca forced herself to pay attention, fighting off the nagging, quiet fear that had settled over her during the fruitless search. Somebody had cleaned out the room, and done a very thorough job of it. She'd found books, staplers, pens and pencils, a ton of rubber bands, and paper clips, but not a single piece of paper with writing on it. Not a scrap of information to work with. Steve's computer search wasn't much better. No map, and nothing at all on the T-virus. Whoever had taken over the facility had apparently wiped out everything they might have been able to use. Except for a shitload of dull psychobabble, which so far hasn't even mentioned the word blue. How are we supposed to accomplish anything here? Steve touched a key, then brightened considerably. Here we go. The Red Series, when looked at on a standardized scale, is the most basic and simple, applicable up to an intelligent quotient of 80. The green series. He broke off, frowning. The screen just went blank. Rebecca looked up from the mostly empty desk she'd been going through as David walked over to join Steve. System crash? He asked worriedly. Steve was still frowning, tapping at keys. More like a program freeze. I don't think... Hello, what's this? Rebecca, David said quietly, motioning for her to come and look. She closed a drawer full of blank, unlabeled file folders and moved over to stand behind Steve, bending down to read what was on the monitor. The man who makes it doesn't need it. The man who buys it doesn't want it. And the man who uses it doesn't know it. It's a riddle, David said. Either of you know the answer? Before either of them could respond, Karen and John walked back into the room, both of them holstering their weapons. Karen held a sheet of torn paper in one hand. Locked up tight, John said. Half a dozen offices, no windows at all, and only one other external door, north end. Karen nodded. 
There were file cabinets in most of the rooms, but they were empty. Except I found this in one of the drawers, stuck in a crack. Must have ripped off when the place was being cleaned out. She handed the piece of paper to David. He scanned a few lines, his dark gaze taking on a sudden intensity. He turned back to Karen. This is all there was? Karen nodded. Yeah, but it's enough, don't you think? David held up the torn sheet and started to read it out loud. The teams continue to work independently, but have shown a marked improvement since the modification of oral synapses. In scenario two, when more than one tri-squad is present, the second team, B, will no longer engage when the first, A, concludes, when target ceases to move or make sound. If the target continues to promote stimuli, and A has discontinued the attack, lack of ammunition slash disabling injury to all units, B will engage. If within range, additional patrols will be drawn to the attack and will engage in succession. At this time, we have not successfully managed to expand sensory ability to trigger desired behaviour. The visual stimuli of scenarios 4 and 7 continue to be unproductive, although we'll be infecting a new group of units tomorrow and expect correlating results by the end of the week. It is our recommendation that we continue to further develop oral capabilities before considering heat detection implantation. That's where it's torn off, David said. Looking up, Karen nodded. It explains a lot, though, why the team at the back door of the boathouse didn't do anything. The team out front was still firing. It wasn't until you and Steve took them out that the second group moved in. Rebecca frowned, not liking the implications of the report for more than just the obvious. Umbrellas continued experimentation on humans. From what she'd seen in Raccoon, the T-virus took seven or eight days to fully amplify in a host, the host then falling to pieces within a month. So what's this about infecting a new group and getting data in a week? Or for that matter, implantation and sensory modification with the hosts they already have. There shouldn't be time for all that. The units should be disintegrating, way beyond learning new behavior. She bit her lip nervously, wondering what the researchers at Caliban Cove might have done with the virus. If they'd found a way to speed up the infective, perhaps tampered with the virion's fusion membrane, made it more cohesive, or somehow multiplied the inclusionary, allowing it to replicate exponentially. We could be looking at a strain that works in hours, not days. It was a nasty thought, and one that she didn't want to consider until she had more information to go on. Besides, it wouldn't make a difference in their current situation. The tri-squads were just as deadly either way. The sign on the north door says we're in Block C, whatever that means, John said, moving to the computer. Did you find a map? Steve sighed. <sighs> no, but take a look. I asked for information on the Blue Series and it started to give us a report on these IQ tests, coded by color. Then this. I can't get anything else. John peered at the screen, mumbling. The man who makes it doesn't need it, uh, buys it, doesn't want it, uses it, doesn't know it. Mm. Karen, who had been re-reading the Tri-Squad material, looked up with sudden sharp interest. Wait, I know that one. It's a casket. Somehow, Rebecca wasn't surprised that Karen knew the riddle. The woman struck her as someone who thrived on puzzles. They all gathered around as Steve quickly typed in, casket. The screen remained unchanged. Try coffin? Rebecca suggested. Steve's fingers flew across the keys. As soon as she hit enter, the riddle disappeared, replaced by Blue Series activated. Then followed Tests 4, Block A, 7, Block D, and 9, Block B, slash Blue to Access Data, Block E. Blue to Aman's message, Karen said quickly. That's it. The message received related to the blue series then said, Enter answer for key. The answer was coffin. 
and then the test numbers are the key, David said. There are three more lines in the message, then blue to access. The lines must be answers to the tests. The letters and numbers reverse. Time, rainbow. And don't count. Jill was right. It's all about something we're supposed to find. Rebecca felt a rush of excitement as David grabbed a pen off the desk and turned over the scrap of Trisquad report. The information they had finally made sense. Dr. Amon's message actually meant something. We can do this. We've got something solid now. David drew five boxes in two lines, the same as on Trent's map, marking the southernmost box with the letter C. After a pause, he tentatively labelled the others, starting at the top with A and going right to left, marking the test numbers next to each letter. Assuming that this is right side up, he said, and that we need to complete the test in order, we'll be moving in a staggered zigzag pattern between the buildings. And assuming the Tri-Squads don't have a problem with that, John said softly. Rebecca felt her excitement dwindle, could see the same mixed emotions and the suddenly sombre expressions they all wore, staring down at the boxes. She'd known that they were going to have to leave eventually, but had somehow managed to avoid thinking about it, putting it off until it was in front of them. It was in front of them now, and the Tri-Squads would be waiting. They stood at the north door in a dark and stuffy hallway, tightening bootlaces, adjusting belts, putting fresh clips into their berettas. When David was ready, he turned to John and nodded. Give it back to me. You, Steve, and Rebecca will take the one on the left, northwest from here. Once we hear you get clear, Karen and I will go straight across. If your guess is right, we'll be in block D. If you're upside down, block B. Either way, we secure the building, find the test number, and then wait for you to show up and give us the go-ahead. And if I don't? Karen took up the recital. If we don't hear from you in half an hour, we come back here and wait for Steve and Rebecca. We complete the tests if it's feasible. John grinned, a white flash in the gloom. And then we get our asses over the fence. Right, David said. Good. They were ready. There were infinite variables in the equation, any number of things that could go wrong with the simple plan. But that was always the case. There was no way to prepare for everything that could happen. Not at this point. And the decision to split up was their best chance to avoid detection by the Tri-Squads. Any questions before we go? Rebecca spoke up, her youthful voice tight with concern. I'd like to remind everyone again to be extremely careful about what you touch or what touches you. The Tri-Squads are carriers, so try to avoid getting close to them, particularly if they're wounded. David shuddered internally, remembering what she'd told them before. That one drop of infected blood could hold millions, hundreds of millions of virus particles. Not a pleasant thought, considering. A nine millimeter round could inflict a lot of damage. And they don't lie down when they're hit. The three by the boathouse just kept coming, walking and firing and bleeding. They were waiting for his signal. David shook the thoughts off and thumbed the safety on his weapon, putting his other hand on the door latch. Ready? Quietly now. On three. One. Two. Three. He pushed the door open and slipped outside into the cool night air and the whisper of ocean waves. It was much brighter than before. The almost full moon had risen high, bathing the compound in silvery blue light. Nothing moved. Straight in front of him, about twenty metres away, was John and Karen's destination. He was relieved to see a door set in the concrete wall facing Block C. They wouldn't have to go around to get inside. David edged away from the door to his left, hugging the narrow shadow of the wall. He could just make out the front of the building he hoped was A. Tall, wind-bent pines to the left and behind it. There was a darker shadow midway along its length, a door, and no cover in the thirty-plus metres that spanned the distance. Once they stepped away from sea, they'd be totally vulnerable. If there's a team between the two lines of buildings, 
He shot a glance back, saw Rebecca and Steve tensed and waiting behind him. If they were going to walk into a corridor of fire, at least he'd be in front. Steve and Rebecca would have time to get back to cover. He took a deep breath, held it, and broke away from the wall, running in a low crouch for the dark square of the block's entry. Shapes of pallid light and shadow blurred past. His entire being was waiting for the flash of an automatic, the crack of fire, the sharp and piercing pain that would take him down. But it was silent and still. The only sound the violent stammer of his heart, the rush of blood through his veins, seconds stretched in eternity as the door loomed closer, larger. Then the latch was under his fingers and he was pushing, bursting into a stifling blackness, spinning around to see Rebecca and then Steve come lunging in after him. David closed the door quickly but quietly, sensing the emptiness of the dark room, the lack of life. And then the smell hit him. Either Steve or Rebecca gagged, a dry bark of involuntary revulsion as David snatched for the torch, already dreading what he knew they would see. It was the same terrible stink that they'd come across in the boathouse, but a hundred times more powerful. Even without the recent reference, David knew the odour. He'd experienced it in the jungle of South America, and in a cultist's camp in Idaho, and, once, in the basement of a serial killer's house. The smell of rotting, multiple death, was unforgettable. A rancid bile like sour milk and fly-blown meat. How many? How many will there be? The beam snapped on, and, as it found the tottering, reeking pile that took up one corner of the large storage room, David saw that there was no way to be certain. The bodies had started to melt into one another, the blackened, shriveling flesh of the stacked corpses blending and pooling from the humid heat. Maybe fifteen? Maybe twenty? Retching, Steve stumbled away and threw up, a harsh and helpless sound in the otherwise quiet room. David quickly took in the rest of the chamber, finding a door against the back wall, the letter A blocked across it in black. Without another look at the terrible mound, he hustled Rebecca toward the far door, grabbing Steve as they passed. Once they were through, the smell faded to barely tolerable. They were in a windowless corridor, and, though there was a light switch next to the door, David ignored it for the moment, catching his breath, letting the two young team members collect themselves. Apparently, they'd found the umbrella workers of Caliban Cove, all but at least one of them, anyway. And David decided that if they ran across him, he'd shoot first and not bother with any questions at all. Karen and John stood at the door for a full minute after the others had gone, cracked open just wide enough for them to listen. Cool air filtered through the opening, the faraway hiss of waves. But no shots, no screams. Karen let the door close and looked at John, her pale features masked in the dim light. Her voice was low, even and terribly serious. They're in by now. You want to take lead, or would you prefer if I went first? John couldn't help himself. My women always go first, he whispered. Though I prefer it when we go together, if you know what I mean. Karen sighed heavily, a sound of pure exasperation. John grinned, thinking about how easy she was. She knew he shouldn't devil her, but it was hard to resist. Karen Driver kicked ass with a weapon, and she was sharp as a tack in the brains department. But she was also one of the most humorless people he'd ever known. It's my duty to help lighten her up. If we're gonna die, might as well be laughing as crying. A simple philosophy, but one he held dear. It had gotten him through many an unpleasant situation in the past. John, just answer the goddamn question. I'll go, he said mildly. Wait till I get through, then follow. 
She nodded briskly, stepping back to let him by. He briefly considered telling her that he'd greet her at the door, wearing nothing but a smile, but decided against it. They'd worked together for almost five years, and he knew from experience that he could only go so far before she got pissy. Besides, it was a good line, and he didn't want to waste it. As soon as his hand closed over the latch, he took a deep breath, letting his sparkling wit take a back seat to what he thought of as his soldier mind. There was humour, and then there was conquering the enemy, and while he enjoyed both immensely, he learnt long ago to keep them separate. Gonna be a ghost now. Gonna slide through the dark like a shadow. He gently pushed the door open. No sound, no movement. Holding his beretta loosely, he stepped away from the building and moved quickly through the silvery dark, fixing on the door that was scarcely twenty steps away. His soldier mind fed him the facts, the cool wind, the soft tread of boots against dirt, the smell and taste of the ocean. But his heart told him that he was a ghost, floating like an invisible shadow through the night. He reached the door, touching the clammy metal bar with steady fingers, and it wouldn't move. The entrance was locked. No panic, no worry. He was a shade that no one could see. He'd find another way in. John held up a hand, telling Karen to wait, and edged smoothly to his right. Silent and easy. Shadow without form. He reached the corner and slid around, letting his heightened senses continue to feed him information. No movement in the whispering night, the rough feel of concrete against his left shoulder and hip, the steady pump of exhilaration and fluidity in his muscles. There was another door, facing the broad, glimmering openness of the sea. Cool, light mat against metal. Ratatatatatatatat! Bullets hit the dirt at his feet. John spun and leapt backward, flattening himself against the wall as he grabbed for the latch. Walking from the direction of the boathouse, a line of three. And John tore the door open and jumped behind it. Heard the clatter of point twenty two rounds smash into the metal. Stopped inches from his body by the explosive ping, 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 ping that rattled the door. He held the door open with his foot, took a split-second look around the edge, and targeted the flash of light, squeezing the trigger as chips of concrete and dust flew from the wall. The nine millimeter jumped, a part of his hand, and he was an animal now, at one with the thundering rounds, the pull of his breath, the awareness of himself both as a man and a bringer of death. Another look, and the line was closer now the three dark figures taking shape. John got off another shot, ducked behind the open door, and when he looked again, there were only two standing. Snap! Behind him, John whirled around and saw them, two of them, ten feet away at the northeast corner of the building, both held automatic rifles, but made no move to fire. He felt panic then, a screaming, whining beast in his gut that threatened to devour him from the inside out. Holy shit. The fusillade of the M16s was still approaching, but he could see only the creatures that stood there, watching him with blank and rubbery eyes, wobbling on unsteady legs. The one on the left had only half a face. From the nose down was a liquid, pulpy mass of tissue. Chunks of dark wetness hanging from strings of elastic flesh. The one on the right looked intact at first, if deathly white and dirty. Until he saw the exploded mass of its belly, the limp, dripping snake of intestines flopped out against his bloody shirt. Won't engage until Team A finishes. John stepped backward into the warm dark of the building, using one distant arm to hold the door open against the pair that still fired. He leaned out and aimed as carefully as he could manage, squashing the panic as best he could. Neither of the creatures moved to defend themselves, only stood there, teetering on rotting legs, 
watching him. Bam! Bam! Two clean headshots, explosively loud over the continuing rattle of the M16s. Before they'd even hit the ground, John heard another 9mm thundering through the darkness, drowning the automatic fire. Karen! He shot another glance around the door and saw the crumpling figures of the engaged team a hundred feet away, one of them still firing as it fell, its rattling rifle aimed uselessly at the sky. Karen crouched out from between the buildings, handgun still pointed at the spasming shooter, her back to John. Teams won't engage. Don't shoot him! Over here! Leave him! She turned, a lithe, graceful spin, sprinting to meet him. As soon as she was through, he pulled the door closed. The crack of automatic fire muted to a dull popping sound. John sagged against the door as Karen fumbled for the lock, his brain still screaming at him that he'd seen the impossible, that he'd just killed two dead men, that there was nowhere he could put that information that wouldn't drive him insane. Can't be. I didn't believe it. Didn't believe it before. Didn't know. And they were dead. They were rotting. And they were... Karen's ragged whisper broke the warm dark, broke through the cycling chain of his spinning, dizzying thoughts. Hey, John, was it good for you? He blinked, the words registering slowly. Going first, I mean, she added. Was it everything you hoped it would be? He felt a creeping amazement take the place of the whirling, terrible thoughts. The confusion ebbing, the waters of his mind becoming clear again. That's not funny, he said. After a beat, they both started to laugh. Whew, that is quite a close call for Karen and John. To be honest, with uh, characters that don't seem to be as plot important and the big plot characters have been taken away, uh, I kind of felt like maybe Karen and John might just die then and there. I thought that might be it, or at least John. I thought John had potentially bought it, um, especially when he saw the second set of zombies. Although, interesting that it used the kind of zombie programming against them as a way to survive the encounter. Speaking of their programming, that reminds me of a comment that Ian Matthew Klein left recently on our Resident Evil City of the Dead audiobook on the finale. Um, And he said, it's been interesting going back and actually looking at the Resident Evil biology from a virologist's perspective. And yeah, it makes absolutely no sense. (laughs) Ha ha. And, uh, Ian definitely has the qualifications. Ian is currently studying a PhD in immunology and virology. Uh, But Ian does say, but maybe that's partly what we love about it. It's just over the top impossible. Looking forward to some of your other Resident Evil titles. Well, I certainly hope you've started listening to, to this book, Ian. I hope you've gotten to this point. And hey, thank you very much for commenting. Let's move on to chapter 10. The farther away they got from the front of the concrete block, the less noxious the air for which Rebecca was deeply grateful. She'd been seconds away from vomiting herself. The smell was that bad. A greasy, oily stench that seemed almost tangible, an entity in itself. As they moved quietly through the well-lit hall, she found herself thinking again about Nicholas Griffith, about the story of the Marburg victims. And although there was no proof that he was behind the mass slaughter of the Umbrella people, she couldn't shake the feeling that he was responsible. The corridor led them past several open rooms, each as barren and sterile as the building they'd come from. They passed an exit at the far side of the block, and after another turn in the hall, finally came to a door marked again with the letter A, and below it, 1 to 4. There were three triangles beneath the numbers, each a different colour, red, green and blue. David opened the door, revealing a much shorter hall, stark fluorescent light spilling onto the stale darkness. There were two doors, one on either side. 
Steve found the lights and turned them on, and Rebecca saw that there were more of the coloured triangles on the door to their right. The other was blank. I'll take the test, David said. Steve, you and Rebecca check out the other room. We'll meet back here. Rebecca nodded, saw Steve do the same. He looked a little pale, but seemed steady enough, though he dropped his gaze when he noticed her looking. She felt a pang of sympathy for him, realising that he was probably embarrassed for losing his lunch. They opened the unlabeled door and stepped into yet another windowless room, as stuffy and warm as the rest of the building. Rebecca turned on the lights, and a rather large office lined with bookshelves flickered into view. A steel desk sat in one corner next to a filing cabinet, the empty drawers standing open. Steve sighed. Looks like another bust, he said. You want the desk or the shelves? Rebecca shrugged. Shelves, I guess. He grinned almost shyly. Just as well. Maybe I can find some breath mints or something in one of those drawers. Rebecca smiled, glad that he'd made the joke. Save me one. I swallowed it down back there, but it was a close call. They locked gazes, still smiling, and Rebecca felt a tiny shiver of excitement run through her as the seconds stretched, lingering a few beats longer than a more casual exchange. Steve looked away first, but his colour had returned, his cheeks slightly pinker than before. He moved to the desk, and Rebecca turned to face a row of books, feeling a little flushed herself. There was a definite attraction there, and it seemed to be mutual. And it's only about the worst time and place to consider it, her mind snapped. Secure that shit pronto. The books were about what she might have expected, considering what they knew about the Tri-Squads and Umbrella. Chemistry, biology, a whole set of leather-bound texts on behaviour modification, several medical journals... As Steve rummaged through the desk behind her, she ran her hand along the row, pushing the books toward the back of the shelf as she glanced over the titles. Maybe there was something hidden behind one of them. Sociology, Pavlov, Psych, Psych, Pathology. She stopped, frowning at a slender black volume tucked between two larger books. No title. She pulled it out and felt her heart speed up as she opened the small book, seeing the spidery handwriting on the lined pages. She flipped to the front, saw Tom Athens, written in neat letters on the inside cover. One of the guys on the list, one of the researchers. Hey, I found a diary, she said. It belongs to one of the people from Trent's list, Tom Athens. Steve looked up from the desk, his dark eyes flashing. No shit. Get to the back. What's the last date? Rebecca shuffled through the pages to the end, scanning as she went. Says July 18th. But it doesn't look like he kept it regular. The one before that is July 9th. Just read the last entry, Steve said. Maybe it'll tell us what's going on. She walked to the desk and leaned against it, clearing her throat. July 18th, Saturday. It's been a long and ridiculous day, the end of a long and ridiculous week. I swear to God, I'm going to beat the crap out of Louis if he calls one more stupid meeting. Today, it was whether or not we should add a new scenario into the Tri-Squad program, as if we need another one. All he really wanted was to get it on paper, and the rest of it was his usual bullshit, the importance of teamwork, the need to share information so we can all stay on the right track. I mean, Jesus, it's like he can't live with the concept that a weekly might go out without his name on it. And he hasn't done dick since the M.A. disaster, except to try and convince everyone that it was Chin's fault. So much for not speaking ill of the dead. Sanctimonious prick. Alan and I talked over the implants yesterday... That's going well. He's going to write up the proposal this week, and we're not going to let Louis touch it. With any luck, we'll get a green light by the end of the month. Alan figures the white boys are going to want to run it past Birkin, though God only knows why. 
B doesn't give a shit what we're doing out here. He's off being brilliant again. I have to admit, I'm looking forward to his next synthesis. Maybe we can work out some of the bugs in the Tri-Squads. There was a minor scare in D on Wednesday in 101. Somebody left the refrigerator open. And Kim swears there are some chemicals missing, although I'm starting to think she miscounted again. Hard to believe she's in charge of the infection process. The woman's a ditz, and she's sloppy as hell when it comes to maintaining the equipment. I'm surprised she hasn't managed to infect the entire compound. God knows there's enough in there to do it. I probably should get over to D myself, make sure everything's ready for tomorrow. Got a new batch shipping in, and Griffith actually asked to watch the process. First time he's come out of the lab in weeks. First time he's ever taken an interest in what the rest of us are doing. I know it's stupid, but I still want him to be impressed. He's as brilliant as Birkin in his own creepy way. I think he even intimidates Louis, and Louis is generally too stupid to care. More later. The rest of the pages were blank. Rebecca looked up at Steve, not sure what to say, her mind working to glean the relevant bits of information from the rambling tirade. There was something in there that bothered her, something that she couldn't quite place. Missing chemicals. Infection process. The brilliant, creepy Dr. Griffith. She no longer had any doubt that Griffith had killed the others, but that wasn't what sent her internal alarms jangling. It was Block D, Steve said, a look of anxious fear playing across his face. If we're in A, Karen and John are in D, where there's enough of the T-virus to infect the entire compound, where the infection process took place. We should tell David, Rebecca said, and Steve nodded, both of them moving quickly for the door. Rebecca hoping desperately that John and Karen wouldn't find room 101, and that, if they did, they wouldn't touch anything that could hurt them. The test room was big, three of the walls lined with open-ended cubicles. Once he'd turned on the lights, he saw that the tests were clearly numbered and colour-coded, the symbols painted on the cement floor in front of each one. All of the red series was on his left, closest to the door. He saw brightly coloured blocks and simple shapes on the tables in each cubicle as he walked past, heading for the back of the room. The green series lined the wall opposite, though he ignored it entirely. The back wall was marked with blue triangles, the number four test in the far right corner. As he neared the back of the room, he heard a faint hum of power coming from the blue test area. There was a small computer on the table in number two, a keyboard and headset in three. As promised, the series was activated, though what they were connected to, he couldn't imagine. Can't imagine and don't care. Once we've solved these little puzzles, we'll find whatever's been hidden for us and get out away from this cemetery. It can't happen soon enough. David had seen all he wanted to see of Caliban Cove. The corpses in the front hall had been bad, but it was the thoughts that they'd inspired that troubled him, made him so suddenly eager to get his team out. The tri-squads were dangerous and deadly. The monster in the cove's waters had been horrible, but somewhere in this facility lurked a monster of a different kind entirely one that had murdered his own people and then stacked them like kindling in a dark place. That kind of insanity chilled him far worse than the immoral greed of Umbrella, and he was afraid of what such a man might do to the handful of soldiers trying to stop him. We'll find the material, probably notes on Umbrella, perhaps on the virus itself, and then break for the fence, get well away from this madness. Let the feds handle the rest. If they're smart, they'll blow up the entire compound and gather the information from the ashes. He stopped in front of the last cubicle, returning his attention to the task at hand. He wasn't sure what he was expecting to see, but the setup of test number four surprised him nonetheless. 
a table and chair, utilitarian grey metal. On the table was a pad of paper, a pencil and an inexpensive chess set, all of the pieces in place. As he stepped into the cubicle, he saw that there was a metal plaque set into the surface of the table, a string of numbers etched into the steel. David sat in the chair, peering down at the numbers. 9223 slash slash 14 26 9 16 8 slash slash 7 19 22 slash slash 8 11 12 7 He frowned, looking up at the chess set, and then back at the numbers. There was nothing else to look at. That was it. He quickly sorted through the clues of Amon's message, wondering which was supposed to be the answer. Was it the letters and numbers reverse, or don't count? since there didn't seem to be anything relating to time or a rainbow. It had to be one of the two. If the lines are in the same order as the tests, this is the letter and number reversal. But what letters? There aren't any. David smiled, suddenly shaking his head. The numbers on the plaque didn't go any higher than 26. It was a code and a fairly simple one. He picked up the pencil and quickly jotted down the letters of the alphabet, then numbered them backward. A was 26, B 25, all the way back to Z, 1. Glancing back and forth between the plaque and the paper, he wrote down the numbers and then started to decipher the message. R, E, X, M. The final letter was a T, and he stared down at the sentence then at the chessboard. It seemed that somebody had a sense of humour. Rex marks the spot. Rex was Latin for king. He reached out and touched the white king. As soon as his fingers contacted the piece, it swivelled in place, turning around to face the back of the board. At the same time, there was a soft, musical tone from overhead. He looked up and saw a tiny speaker set into the ceiling. Nothing else happened. No flashing lights or secret passageways opening up behind the wall. Apparently, he'd passed. How anticlimactic. It seemed like an awfully complicated test for something so supposedly mindless as a tri-squad zombie. Though perhaps the researchers had been making plans for something else, something intelligent. It was an unsettling thought, and not one he wanted to ponder. He stood up and turned toward the front of the room. Just as the door burst open, Rebecca and Steve hurrying in, wearing matching expressions of fear. What is it? Rebecca held up a book, talking fast. We found a journal. It says that the strain of the virus used to infect the tri squads is in Block D, in Room 101. Maybe everything's fine, but if John and Karen touch anything that's been contaminated... He'd heard enough. Let's go. They turned, and he strode past them, leading them back the way they'd come, his thoughts racing. They had passed an exit on the far side of the building. He could send Steve and Rebecca to the next block over while he went to D, just as originally planned only much faster, and now carrying the horrible, heavy fear that two of his people might accidentally uncover the T-virus. It won't happen. They'll be careful. The chances of one of them getting a cut and then touching something dangerous in a room that's been bound to be marked as some kind of laboratory. The reassuring facts did nothing to ease his mind. They hurried toward the exit, a deepening knot of dread settling in the pit of David's stomach. They stood in the bright corridor at the centre of D-Block, silently listening for a sound that would tell them David had come. From their position, they should be able to hear any one of the three external doors being used. After securing the building and finding the test room, she and John had chocked open all of the passages that led to the block's exits. Karen checked her watch 
and then rubbed her eyes, feeling a bit worn out from all the night's events, and still sickened by what they'd found in room 101. Even John seemed unusually subdued, and definitely quieter than normal. He hadn't cracked a single joke since they'd walked back to begin their wait. Maybe he's thinking about the gurneys, fixed with bloody restraints, or the syringes, or the surgical equipment heaped in the sink. They'd found the test room first, a large chamber filled with little tables, each marked with numbers between five and eight. Karen had been somewhat disappointed to see that the blue series number seven was just a handful of coloured tiles with letters on them, half of them upside down and unreadable. All the colours corresponded to a rainbow's, though there were two extra violet tiles in the heaped pile. Since they couldn't risk messing with it until David had completed the first test, she'd reluctantly turned away, suggesting that they check out the rest of the block. They'd gone through a couple of offices, empty, and a cluttered coffee room, where they'd found a box of incredibly mouldy donuts and little else. It had been the chemical lab that had told them the most about what kind of place Umbrella had created. And although Karen didn't believe in ghosts, the room had given her a feeling like nothing she'd ever experienced before. It was haunted, plain and simple. Haunted by the misery of fear and the cold, Nazi-esque precision of scientists committing atrocities against their fellow man. You thinking about that room? John asked softly. Karen nodded, but didn't say anything. John seemed to sense her unspoken desire not to talk about it, for which she was thankful. The weight of her good luck charm was the only other comfort she felt at the moment, and she longed to take it out, to feel reassured by memories of her father and successful missions gone by. Anything to take her mind off the lab room. The outer door to 101 was clearly marked with a biohazard symbol, and they briefly discussed not going in at all. John arguing against entering a possibly contaminated environment. Karen had pointed out that neither of them had any cuts or abrasions and that they might find something about the T-virus to take with them. The truth was, she couldn't stand to let such an opportunity pass. She wanted to see what was behind the closed door, because it was there. Because leaving it unopened would get under her skin. John had finally agreed and they'd gone in, stepping into a small entryway that was draped with sheets of heavy plastic. There were shower nozzles overhead and a drain set into the floor. A decon area. A smaller second door had opened up into the room itself, leading them into a mad scientist's dream. Glass crunching underfoot, a tired smell of anxious sweat beneath the acrid odour of bleach. John found the lights, and even before the large room snapped into view, Karen felt her heart start to pound. There was a dark tension that filled the air, a sense of foreboding that radiated from the very walls. It looked like a dozen other lab facilities she'd worked in, counters and shelves, a couple of metal sinks, a large stainless steel refrigeration unit in one corner with a lock on the handle. And... Somehow, that was the worst, that the environment was so familiar, a place she'd always felt at home. The few differences were dramatic ones. The room was dominated by a stainless autopsy table, fitted with Velcro restraints, and there were two additional hospital gurneys next to it, likewise fitted. As she walked over to look at one of them, she saw the dark, dried stains at either end, the thin pad was soaked with blood from where a man's ankles and wrists would be. In the back of the room was a cage the size of a large walk-in closet, heavy bars surrounding an unpadded bench. Next to the cage, several slender poles leaned against the wall, each a metre or so in length and tipped with hypodermic needles. They were the kinds of instruments used to drug wild animals allowing the person operating them to not get within reach. Karen looked down at the gurney, 
lightly touching the long, dried stain, wondering what kind of person would have willingly participated in such an experiment. The crust of blood was old, powdery, and filled her with thoughts of what the victims must have endured, waiting in the cage, perhaps watching as some gloved madman injected a toxic, mutating virus into a helpless human being. It was a bad place, a place of evil deeds. They'd both felt it, both been affected by the realisation of what had gone on there. Karen's right eye itched, distracting her from the terrible remembrance, drawing her back to the present. She rubbed at it, then looked at her watch again. It had only been twenty minutes since the team had split, though it felt longer. There was a sound of a door opening, followed by David's excited shout through the corridor. He'd come in through the west entrance. Karen! John! John grinned at her, and she felt a wave of relief. David was okay. Here, keep walking, John called back. Take a ride at the tee. His footsteps pounded through the hall. In a few seconds, he appeared at the corner and jogged toward them, his face tight with concern. Is everything? Karen started to ask, but David cut her off. Did you find the laboratory room? Room 101? John frowned, his smile fading. Yeah, it's back the way you came. Did either of you touch anything? Do you have any cuts, any small wounds that might have come in contact with anything? Their confusion must have shown... David spoke quickly, looking back and forth between them. We found a journal, naming it as the room where they infected the Tri-Squads. John smiled again. Well, no shit, we figured that much out in about two seconds. Karen held out her hands, turning them over for David to see. Not a scratch. David exhaled sharply, his shoulders sagging. Oh, thank God. I had the worst feeling all the way over that something had happened. We found the researchers in Block A. Amon was right. He killed them. And now our he has a name now. Rebecca seems certain that it's Nicholas Griffith. He was the one she recognized from Trent's list, and he has a rather sordid history. She can fill you in when we regroup. He shook his head, a wavering smile on his lips. I just... I suppose I let my imagination run wild for a moment. John smiled wider. Jeez, David, I had no idea you cared. Or that you thought we'd be stupid enough to stick ourselves with dirty needles in a place like this. David laughed, a soft, shaky sound. Please, accept my sincerest apologies. Where are Steve and Rebecca? Karen asked. Probably in the next test area by now. I saw them safely off to Block B before I came here. Did you find Test 7? This way. John said, and as they started down the hall, he began to recount their run-in with the Tri-Squads. Karen followed, rubbing at the maddening, elusive itch in her right eye. She must have irritated it with all of the rubbing. It seemed to be getting worse. And to top things off, she felt a headache coming on. She wiped at her eye, sighing inwardly at the timing. She never got headaches unless she was coming down with something. The swim in the ocean must have set her up nicely for a cold. And, from the building throb in her head, it was going to be a nasty one. Oh dear, oh dear, Karen, you don't know just how nasty it's gonna be. You shouldn't have rubbed your eye, girl! You shouldn't have done that! That's like cutting up chilies and then rubbing your eye. It's always gonna go badly! Oh no! So sad to see, but one of you had to die. You've all survived for far too long, in my opinion. I don't know if John's going to make it. I'm not sure if Steve will make it. I feel like Steve might die purely because he is a kind of love interest. And yes, I have read the book before, but it was years ago, so I'm choosing not to remember, is <laughs> the way I'm seeing it. <laughs> I do want to praise this chapter, actually, because this chapter has shown a few... Th uh, foreshadowing things to stuff that comes up in the later books and the later games. And I think it's really interesting. And actually, um, I mentioned on our uh, City of the Dead 
uh, read through that I was interested about how the uh, retriever tyrant, Mr. X, uh, actually like had circuitry in him and had programming to make him hunt things down. Uh, he's after a Sherry Birkin, of course. Um, and it's really fascinating that actually, yeah, I suppose this whole thing of teaching the zombies, this perhaps is research that might have fed into the creation of Mr. X and the retriever tyrant. These are the sort of um, cognitive things they need one of these infected creatures to do. I've said before, I really appreciate how the author S.D. Perry really works the video games into books and kind of brings them to life. Uh, I think uh, we had another commenter who agrees. Uh, the real Ada Wong says it's absolutely immaculate how Perry captures the pacing, emotions and cross sections of the game into a cohesive story. And this is a comment on the City of the Dead book. Um, and... Uh, Ada Wong says, I know I'm simping, but this reveals so much of Ada's character, how she worked up to the assignment, rather than a concept that pushed the subplot. Here, we actually know her employer, Trent, a rival of Umbrella, a plotline that Capcom has yet to reveal, who Ada has always worked for. And I think that's something really important to notice, is that, yeah, these books give us details that Capcom never did, give us these insights that Capcom never did. And I had to say uh, to uh, Real Ada Wong on their comment that I kind of wish that uh, S.D. Perry had written an adaptation of Resident Evil 4 into a book. It would have been an insane book. How, what a difficult game to turn into a book of just like, yeah, make this weird madness in Spain make sense. But... Dang, I would have loved to have seen her show those scenes, you know, show Ada's point of view when her and uh, Leon are finally reunited. But no mind to dwelling over what never was. Let's continue reading with chapter 11. After he'd instructed Athens and sent him on his way, he'd prepared the syringes and decided on a place to hide. There was nothing left for him to do but wait. In spite of his earlier feelings of confidence, he was nervous now, pacing through the lab restlessly. What if Athens had forgotten how to load a rifle? What if the enclosure release didn't work? Or the intruders had the firepower to stop the MA7s? He tried to prepare for every possibility, each plan unfolding into a backup. But what if everything failed? If all of them fell through? I'll kill myself. I'll strangle them with my bare hands. They will not stop me from doing what must be done. They can't. Not after all I've accomplished. Not after everything I've been through to get where I am. For the second time that day, he flashed back to the takeover of the compound. The strange, vivid images of that bright and sunny day less than a month ago. Instead of blocking the thoughts as he'd done before, he let them come inviting them in to remind him of what he was capable of doing when the need arose. He abruptly stopped pacing and moved to a chair, collapsing into it and closing his eyes. A bright and sunny day. Once he'd realised what had to be done, he'd planned for it over two weeks, working over each detail tirelessly until he'd been satisfied that every variable had been addressed. He'd spent time reading about the Tri-Squads and going through the Master Logs, memorising the routine of the facility. He'd watched the habits of his colleagues, learned their schedules, until he could have recited them backward. He'd stared for hours at the sketches he'd made of each building, walking through them in his mind a thousand times. After careful consideration, he chose a date, and, several days before, He'd slipped into the Tri-Squad's processing room and stolen several small vials of extremely powerful medication. Chylosynthesine, memesidine, tralfonide, animal tranquilizers and a synthesized narcotic, some of Umbrella's finest work. It had only taken him an afternoon to get the mix the way he'd wanted it, just as he'd hoped. Then he'd waited much as he was waiting now. The day before his plan was to unfold, he'd watched the Tri-Squad processing and then asked Tom Athens to come to the lab after dinner to politely discuss some thoughts he'd had on intensifying the suggestibility factor. Athens had been only too happy to accept, had listened eagerly to Griffith's description of the strain he'd already created, couched in hypothetical terms, of course. And... 
after a nice hot cup of laced coffee, Athens had become the first to experience Griffith's miracle. Griffith smiled, remembering those initial glorious moments, the very first and the truly most important test of the strain's effectiveness. He told Athens that the only voice he could hear was that of Nicholas Griffith, that all others would be meaningless babble, and the suggestion had taken as easily as that. In the early hours of that fateful morning, he'd played a tape of one of Athens' own lectures for the compliant doctor, and the doctor had heard nothing but gibberish. If it had failed, Griffith would have aborted the takeover, no one the wiser. He'd had an unfortunate accident in mind if the strain hadn't worked the way it was supposed to. Athens' body would have been found the next day, washed up on the rocky beach. But the incredible success of his creation had proved beyond doubt that it was meant to be, that he really had no choice but to continue. And so the kitchen, the drops of sedative in the coffee cups, on the pastries, injected oh so carefully into the fruit and dissolved into the milk, the juices. Of the nineteen men and women who lived and worked in Caliban Cove, only one regularly skipped breakfast and didn't drink coffee, Kim DeSanto, the ridiculous young woman who worked with the T-virus. Griffith had sent Athens to slit her throat as she lay sleeping before the sun came up. And it was a bright and sunny day. Cloudless and clear as they gobbled their breakfasts and swallowed their coffee, walking out into the cool morning air, collapsing to the ground, many of them not making it out of the cafeteria before they stumbled and fell, a few crying out that they'd been poisoned as the words failed them and the drug sent them to sleep. Griffith frowned, trying to remember what had happened next. He'd selected Thurman, unable to resist the petty pleasure of showing the good doctor what he'd created. Then Alan Kinnison, although he hadn't given the gift to Alan until later, keeping him sedated. He knew the facts. Thurman and Athens had disposed of the workers and piled them in Block A. Lyle Amon had managed to keep himself hidden for a time, but had been found by the tri-squads later that evening. Griffith had eaten a late supper and gone to bed, waking up early to move papers and software to the lab. These were facts, things that he knew. But for some reason, the reality had blurred, and he couldn't actually remember what he had seen, what had transpired for him the rest of that day. Griffith searched through his thoughts, concentrating, but could only find the same hazy and uncertain images. A blinding midday sun, bathing the sleeping bodies in red. The scream of a gull over the cove, relentless and wild, calling to the hot wind. A coppery smell of dirt and... and... blood on my hands. On the scalpel that glittered wet and sharp and plunged into soft, yielding flesh of faces and bellies and eyes, and later the thundering crash of waves in the dark and the pool of fishing line, and Amon, Amon waving. His eyes snapped open, and the nightmare was over. Shaken, Griffith looked around at the cool, soft light of the laboratory. He must have dozed off for a moment. Must have. Yes, that was it. He'd fallen asleep and had had a terrible dream. He looked at the clock, saw that only a few moments had passed since he'd seen the two doctors out. He felt a rush of relief, realising that he hadn't been asleep for very long. But as the relief ebbed, he felt the nervousness slip back into his body, jittering and pulsing anxiety about the intruders that had come to his facility. They won't stop me. It's mine. Griffith stood up and started to pace restlessly, back and forth, waiting.
the time rainbow test number seven took only a moment longer to complete than test number four, what David had started to think of as the chess test. John and Karen had shown him to the small table in the big room, standing behind him as he'd uprighted the coloured tiles and laid them out. Beneath the heap of nine rainbow-shaded pieces was an elongated indentation, perhaps a foot long and two inches across. It was clear that just seven of the tiles would fit. Seven colours in the rainbow, seven tiles. Simple. So why are there nine of them? David ordered the pieces by their colours, placing them in a row beneath the indentation. Each bore a different letter on the top, inked in black. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. And three violet tiles with three different letters. Is it supposed to spell something? John asked. Going from left to right, the first six tiles read J-F-M-A-M-J. Not in English, Karen said mildly. The three violet pieces were J, M and F. David sighed. It's one of those where you have to figure out the next in the series, he said, apparently relating to time. Any thoughts? John and Karen both stared down at the puzzle, studying the letters. He wondered if they were as tired as he was starting to feel. John seemed distinctly less chipper than usual, and Karen looked fairly wiped out, her skin pale and gaze somewhat distant. And of course they're tired, but at least they're making an attempt. David looked back at the coloured pieces and tried to focus, but couldn't seem to manage a single coherent idea. It had been an awfully long day, periods of intense concentration interspersed with violent rushes of adrenaline. He'd run through fear, self-doubt, determination, and then fear again, plus a handful of less clear-cut emotions. Now he just felt frazzled, waiting to see what would come next. John grinned suddenly, a triumphant light in his eyes. The letters stand for the months. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. It's J. The last letter is J. Brilliant, David said. He started to place the tiles in the indentation as John nudged Karen with his elbows still grinning. And you thought all I was good for was easy sex. As usual, Karen didn't bother answering. Relieved to be through the second test, David pushed the last piece into place. There was a faint click, and the rainbow lowered very slightly, perhaps a millimetre. From above them, a gentle chime sounded from a speaker, this one hidden by a fluorescent bar. Well, that's all I get? John quipped. No parade? David stood up, smiling tiredly. I felt the same way with the other one. We should get moving, see how Steve and Rebecca are making out. Interesting way of putting it, David. John said, chuckling. <laughs> nice one. It took David a moment to get it, though Karen rolled her eyes almost immediately, then scratched at them. When she took her hand away, David saw that her right eye was extremely bloodshot. The left was also slightly discoloured, though not as badly. She noticed his scrutiny and smiled at him, shrugging. I irritated it somehow. It itches, but it's fine. Don't rub it, you'll make it worse, David said, leading them toward the door. And have Rebecca take a look when we get across. They walked back into a connecting corridor and started for the back exit, David stealing himself for another dash across the compound. By his count, they managed to take down three of the tri-squads in full, three men outside of the boathouse and a fourth on the run to the first building. Then John and Karen's five between blocks C and D. Useful information if you happen to know how many of the squads there were to begin with. He ignored the inner sarcasm as they reached the metal door, Karen leaning back to turn off the overhead light. They pulled out weapons and took deep breaths, preparing, and David felt a familiar sensation wash over him, one that he'd experienced before in tight situations but had never been able to name. It wasn't a feeling so much as a state of existence. And although not a religious man, it was the closest thing he'd found to belief in fate. 
a sense that there were patterns at play beyond the realm of human influence. Whatever was going to happen, whatever was already happening, even as they readied themselves to step back outside, all of the deciding factors were now firmly in place, interlocking like pieces of a puzzle. He felt it with a certainty that denied reason. It was as though a great wheel of chance that determined outcome that would show them life or death, success or failure, had been set into motion and was now spinning toward its inevitable conclusion. Only instead of slowing down, the wheel would turn steadily faster, speeding up as it revealed to them what the cosmos had planned. In the past, he'd often found comfort in the sudden awareness of that spinning wheel, the undefinable sense that the outcome had been decided and all anyone could do was watch it unfold. When he'd been a child, and his father had been on one of his drunken, abusive rampages, the belief in a bigger picture had sometimes been the only thing that saved him from total despair. This time, though, this time, it felt like a terrible thing. A dark and whirling carnival ride that they had boarded by mistake, not realising the truth until it was too late. That they couldn't go back. That there was no avoiding whatever lay ahead. We hang on, then. We do what we can. David stepped to the door, flicking the Beretta's safety off. Whether or not they had any control over what was to come, Rebecca and Steve were waiting. The test room was quiet, except for the soft hum from the machines marked with blue numbers, 9 through 12, and the occasional rustle of a turning page as Rebecca went through Athens's journal. Steve sat on the edge of a table and watched her read, his thoughts restless and uneasy as they waited for the others to show up. His chest ached mildly, both from the small calibre round he'd taken earlier and the anxious build of worry for John and Karen. After a quick look at the other rooms in the building, they both agreed that the test room was the place to wait. It seemed that Block B of the Umbrella Facility was mostly devoted to surgical aspects of the bioweapons research, the rooms all white and steel, ominously stark and unpleasant. Although the building was as stuffy and warm as the others they'd been in, Steve had felt a physical chill as they'd passed the empty operating rooms, as if the chambers themselves had taken on the characteristics of the T-virus creatures, cold and lifeless and somehow mindlessly black with purpose. Rebecca looked up, her eyes flashing with excitement. Listen to this! They're still waiting for our feedback on expansion ever since Griffith revved up the amp time. We've got the space for up to 20 units, but I'm going to hold strong on a max of 12. We wouldn't be able to concentrate on training more than four squads at a time. Amon said he'll back me up if there's any hassle. Steve nodded, half dismayed and half relieved by the information. They'd already knocked one of the tri-squads out of the running, plus seriously wounded or killed a couple of the individuals on another team. That was good. On the other hand, it meant that there were still a couple of the squads roaming around out there. Unless they're currently engaged with David and the others. He scowled inwardly, grasping for something else to think about. Do you know what that means? Uh, revved up the amp time? Rebecca nodded slowly, worry creasing her brow. I'm pretty sure he means that Griffith sped up the amplification process. Amplification is the term for a virus's spread through a host. That didn't sound like something he wanted to think about either. By some unspoken agreement, they hadn't talked about the possibility of John or Karen being infected since David had left. Great. Do you find anything else in there? She shook her head. Not really. He mentions the MA7s a couple of times, but but nothing more specific than that they're a T-virus experiment that didn't work, and he's definitely kind of an asshole. Kinda? Rebecca smiled briefly. Okay, that's an understatement. He's a money-hungry, amoral bastard. Steve nodded, thinking about the partial report they'd found on the Tri-Squads. And for that matter, the very existence of the facility. Calling the T-virus victims units 
setting up operating rooms and aptitude tests to run them through like rats in a maze. It's like they can't acknowledge that they're performing their experiments on human beings, on real people. How could they do this? He asked softly, as much to himself as Rebecca. How did they sleep at night? Rebecca gazed at him solemnly, as if she had an answer but wasn't sure how to say it. Finally, she sighed. And when you specialize in one field, particularly when it's a field that demands linear thinking and a very defined focus on only one tiny element of something, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's frighteningly easy to get lost in that single element, to forget that there's a world outside of that element. When you spend your days looking into a microscope surrounded by numbers and letters and processes, some people get lost. And if they were unstable to begin with, the ambition to pursue that element can take over, making everything else unimportant. Steve saw what she was getting at and was impressed anew with how thoughtful she was, how clearly she communicated herself. All that and a smile that lights up a room. If, when, we get out of this, I'm moving to Raccoon City. Or at least I'll find out if she's seeing anyone. There was a sound from somewhere in the building. Footsteps. Steve pushed himself off the table and walked quickly to the door. He leaned out into the corridor and heard David's voice calling through the empty block. In the back! Steve shouted, then waited anxiously watching the corner in the hall for David to walk into view. John and Karen both healthy and smiling beside him. Rebecca moved to stand next to Steve, and he saw the same concern and hope written across her delicate features. Instinctively, he groped for her hand, feeling a tingling jolt as their fingers touched, half expecting her to pull away. But she didn't, leaning against him instead as she held his hand gently, her skin soft and warm on his. John's booming voice preceded him down the corridor, loud and full of bright good humor. Get your clothes on, kids, you've got company. She dropped his hand quickly, but the look that she flashed him more than made up for it, a sweet and wistful expression that made his heart skip a beat. There was a maturity there, too, a realization of the circumstances they were in, an acknowledgement of priorities. No more until we're out of here. He nodded slightly, and then turned to wait for the others. And on that little meet-cute moment, where, you know, you're getting together while the zombies are attacking, it's uh, interesting. It's, it happened in City of the Dead, and it's happening in Caliban Cove, too. Uh, yeah, on that, we have to end our episode. That was a fun chapter. I have to say, I think uh, S.D. Perry has really made this, even though it is an original story, so it's not based on a game, she's understood that, like, there are some things that are just kind of key to Resident Evil and puzzles that don't really make that much sense in the context of the story. Well, that's just part of it. Although I have to give her some props that actually with the aptitude testing of the tri-squads and the tests you see going on in the day-to-day -day of the facility, the puzzles make a bit more sense. There's a bit more like, oh, okay, I can see why that would be here, rather than, okay, you just decided to make the lock to this room a medallion, because, yeah, that's how you do stuff at a high-powered um, pharmaceutical company conglomerate thing. And it was really fun to just switch back to the villain's point of view for a little while. I love how crazy he is. I love, like, you're sort of seeing his inner turmoil. I also find it kind of funny that, like, you know, he knows that there are armed people breaking into his facility. He's murdered so many people. He's done such terrible things. And he's kind of, like, wandering around in his slippers being like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm a bit worried. Oh, best calm down. <laughs> like, I'm surprised he hasn't sat down with a cup of chamomile tea. But it is all part of the fun. And we not that much left of this book. It might be possible to finish it next episode. Oh, actually, probably not. 
I don't know. We will see. But there won't be that many more videos of Caliban Cove. It is one of the shorter books of the Resident Evil series. Thank you so much for joining me. If you've liked this video, please click the like button. It really helps. And certainly, if you like the video and you're not yet subscribed, please do so and come and join the ranks of the Fulcrum Knights. We'd be glad to have you. If you do subscribe, make sure to hit that bell icon so you get notifications whenever our videos come out. And until I see you next time, remember my friend, we are all Fulcrum.